Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and welcome to BIC's second day of web seminars featuring our additives for thermoplastics applications. Today we have five presentations covering a range of our additive products. And the first presenter, without further ado, is Mr. Jorg Galinsky, who is head of global end use for our industrial thermoplastics division. Jorg, all yours. Thanks, Tom, for introducing me and also a warm welcome from my side. Um, for those who dialed in again or for those who've been here um, the first time on our web seminar of uh, this autumn. Um, my presentation is about flame retardant synergies and additives um, for flame retardancy, um, which we offer to this industry. My presentation is divided in three topics. What are clay based additives? and uh, what type of clay based additives do we offer as flame retardant synergists and what kind of, kind of for formulated flame retardant concentrates do we have in our range um, for this type of application. So let's get started into the first part of my presentation. So clay based additives, what do we understand uh, about this? And we already described it in one of our presentations yesterday in a few words already. So uh, uh, the clay we, we have in our range is, is, is based on uh, natural montmorillite or smectite, which we dig out of the earth and um, then process them. And um, I will show this uh, a bit later a bit and how we do that. If we talk about clay, um, it's uh, basically a mineral filler. And here's a comparison uh, to standard fillers such as glass bubbles. Uh, or calcium carbonate, kaolin, talc, glass fibers, carbon fibers, or clay as monoid as we have them. And what you can, what you all could already could see is that the um, form is is is, is like a platelet compared to a standard filler, which is a spherical or cubic or a fiber. Uh, the L over D ratio of this material is relatively large compared to other uh, fillers. Density is, is more in the range of a standard filler and uh, also the dimension of the primary particle is um, compared to the others quite small. Um, the use case of clay based additives or of clays in this application is basically as a flame retardant synergist, as anti dripping or shell formation additives in cable applications. Uh, very, very often been used in so-called HFFR cables, so so-called halogen-free flame retardants. Uh, it's been used as, as a barrier additive for O2 barrier, water vapor barrier, or solvents in plastics for lightweight composites, as been shown in one of our presentations yesterday, or as in um, as compatibilizer uh, for some kind of, of plastic blends. The clay is such if we if we dig it out of the earth, we um, clean it, we um, drill, mill it, we um, bring it in, into the right form, and then we chemically modify it by exchanging uh, the salt structure by by organic uh, by organics, so so-called intercalation to widen up the stacks of this um, um, staple kind of of uh, primary agglomerates. To make this make it easier to disperse them in the final application, which is called exfoliation. Um, the typical uh, process in how to do it is is basically on on most kind of standard dispersing and compounding equipment. Um, we suggest, especially for the cable applications for the HFF arc applications, to have a relatively high shearing screw setup uh, to um, allow a good exfoliation, a good dispersion of the clay. A typical um, device is a bus needer or a twin screw with an L over D more than 40. Um, typically uh, on a twin screw, the, the material, the clay as such, has been feeded by side feeding, um, like the mineral fillers or the flame retardants have been feeded as well. Um, exfoliation. There are different way how to explain it, and if you don't do it very good, then on uh, like in the PRM picture on the right hand side uh, can be seen. It, it looks pretty ugly, uh, very much in agglomerates, and uh, the ideal cases on the far left side um, should be dispersed well. Each clay 
particle has been exfoliated as a single particle, or very often, like in the middle picture, it's semi good dispersed. We call it still bad, but for many applications, the the so-called ba bad dispersion is already quite sufficient. Um, so coming to clay-based additives as we have them in our program, what are, can they do? What are they doing? These two pictures show a, a typical cone calorimeter testing of a flame uh, of a cable formulation. And what you see on the left hand side is a typical um, EVA filled with 65% uh, aluminum hydroxide. And you see that this is the, the ash formation on such kind of a cone calorimeter. And you already see that the ash is quite, um, dist looks quite destroyed. Um, the ashes is, is, uh, is um, the crust of the ash has been um, collapsed kind of. And on the right hand side, you see the same formulation, but with 53% of ATH instead of 65%, but also contain 5% of a typical clay from our, um, out of our range, the Big Max CD 4262, one of our products. And you see you have a very nice ash formation. It looks like a stable ash formation. And if you really touch the surface of these ashes by your finger, it is almost as stable as an eggshell. Um, you can imagine um, whether they're on the left hand side, it's quite fluffy and, and destroys just when you tip it by your finger. Um, what does the clay as well is in, on the left hand side again, a normal uh, of the picture, a, a normal clay formulation, a, a, a normal cable formulation, I'm sorry, um, with 65% ATH in EVA. And you see it, it, it burns, but it also drips when it burns. And if you have this a similar formulation containing 53% of ATH, 5% of clay. It burns, but it doesn't drop. And by that, it forms an ash surface on an ash crust on the surface, and that is uh, makes it easier to distinguish the fire um, from such kind of um, cable formulation. Uh, this chart shows uh, um, he um, heat rele release rate of such kind of formulation. The red curve uh, shows the heat release um, by ki kilowatt per square meter and uh, the um, um, energy um, on a cone calorimeter test on the lower side. And you see that um, the red curve um, is a 65% EVA formulation um, and you have a peak heat release. And when you use a clay by 5%, and we have here two different type of, uh, types of clays um, uh, been used here and uh, lowered the, you know, the amount of ATH, we still have a very similar heat release rate uh, of the formulation, whether with, the, with our Cloyset SD3000 type of clay, as well as with the Big Mac CT4260 type of clay. Um, our clay products and some some uh, data about uh, our products. So we offer three different types of clays for HFFR formulations. Um, one is the Cloyster 20A with a uh, D50 of six and a relatively low bulk density of 165 uh, gram per liter. And um, when you compare it to um, our other types of, of grades, the Big Mac CT40 to 60, you see that it's um, higher in density um, um, by the same organic loading as well. And then we have basically the last one, the Cloyset SE3000, which has a, a relatively similar bulk density to, to the CT40 to 60, um, but as well, um, um, and, and D50 of six comparable with the closet 20A. Um, the application, I'm going to show these products, how they perform and how how they work. Uh, I'm going to show on the next slide. So typical applications here is a halogen flame retardant cable formulation based on LLDPE or EVA. The typical flame retardant where this can be used with this ATH MDH with a load of 60, 65% some antioxidant oxidants and uh, processing ads, some coupling agents have been used and basically these kind of formulations have been used for uh, cable jacketing most of the time. Um, here an application example, um, when using a high amount of clay, 
um, like shown here in, in on, on the picture, as I already said, the Shah formation is not very good and it also the formation drips when you burn it, but also the elongation at break um, is at a relatively low level. So the FR test may, may work relatively good, but the mechanical uh, in terms of the mechanical properties here is shown in the elongation at break is relatively modest or low compared to a 58 uh, percent ATH uh, load, but then uh, when no clay is present, um, the FR test fails, but the mechanicals are okay. So if we're going to use a clay in in such kind of um, application uh, and replacing another 5% of the 85% ATH by the clay, uh, we still have a good performance or we have a good performance in, in flammability. We have a good ash formation as well, but also we keep the elongation at break and still have um, um, uh, a good FR test um, when testing this one. Um, further tests um, I'm going to show um, in the next slides here are um, tests um, made in um, an EVA with um, um, ATH from um, this type of uh, multinational oil with 65% compared to 55% of, uh, um, of the formulations containing 3% of the clay. And we benchmark Cloyster 20A against CT4260 against SE3000. So all the um, um, results I'm going to show are compounded on our twin screw, uh, twin screw lab line, uh, 25 L over D40 extruder uh, co-rotating twin screw. After that, we, we make granulates, made granulates out of that and made a tape instead of a cable to simulate kind of a, of a cable. And, uh, and out of that, we made all our mechanical and uh, flammability testings. So we measured mechanical properties like a tensile test, electric, uh, electrical properties as volumetric resistance uh, with, with and without seven days water storage, water pickup after seven days was measured, melt flow rate um, of, of the cable compound was measured and the flame flame test by UL94 test with three millimeter thickness was tested as well. So here are the results um, in terms of tensile strength. The uh, formulation containing 65% um, is kind of a benchmark in terms of tensile test. And you can see the both products SE close at 20A and CT4260 are performing on the same level. Keep in mind, they all contain only 58% of mineral filler or 53% uh, compared to 65% in the standard formulation with the red bar. The SD3000 as such performs a little lower in terms of tensile strength. And if, if you take a, a, a look at the elongation at break, you will see that we have an improvement in all formulations containing the clay, maybe also even slightly better with the SD3000, um, um, which uh, can be seen on the far right side. Uh, in terms of the volumetric resistivity, you can see that we have a slightly higher volumetric resistivity with the clay formulations. And if we take a look at the, at the volume resistivity after water storage, you can also see that this has uh, been improved with the clay, the clay as well, and also a bit further with the SE3000 type of clay. If we take a look at the water absorb absor absorption after seven days, uh, you could see that the water absorption, absorption goes down with the SE3000 compared to the other clay types. Um, with melt flow rate, we, we can see that the clay as such um, gives a slightly higher melt flow um, because we have less mineral filler in the formulation. And with the SE3000, it's even better in flowability if this is wanted by the cable formulation. Um, when testing these kind of, uh, of materials, all four formulation pass the UL94 test by B0. Um, and that's basically what we have for the clay. If we come to um, our formulated flame retardants, we have one product in our range at the moment, which is the Bookmet Max FR4143, which is a halogen free FR compacted additive mix. And um, it's a granulated material like shown here on the picture. 
the compacted material, the cold extruded material with no carrier. Um, by itself, the, the product is very effective on compacted mixtures of flame retardant additives. These additives are halogen free and for a protective intumescence layer and preventing the excess of oxygen to the substrate. So the highest FR standards can be reached with all kinds of these uh, materials. Um, they are halogen and antimon free, easy to dose as a granulate, very effective in, 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 in all, in, in, very effective in their content, very, uh, for, um, the performance of this product uh, compared to halogen, uh, halogenated flame retardants is right on the, more or less on the same level. Uh, they can be used as master batches, as uh, like kind of post additivation as well during compounding. They have an active um, rate, dosage, uh, active rate of about 100%. The dosage and final part have to be at 15 to 25% um, in, in the final compound to be, um, yeah, to be working. That's basically all what I have in my presentation. And now um, I'm um, open for your question. Thank you. Jörg, thank you very much. Um, good presentation, a lot of information there. Um, we do have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, first one coming here is, um, does the clay also work as a synergist, a synergist with other HFFR substances? You talked about okay. uh, aluminium and magnesium hydroxide. Yeah, it can be used for phosphorinated flame retardants as well. Um, it's, it's always a question of uh, what is what do I expect? Um, what kind of um, uh, requirements do, do I need to reach in terms of flame redundancy? But in these cases, we can help with our lab or in, in discussing with one of our technicians um, how to handle this. Okay, thank you. Uh, right at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about processing. Um, obviously, a uh, key part of being able to disperse the uh, clay product. But for flame retardant uh, performance, do we actually have to achieve exfoliation, as, as we've heard about in other clay presentations? So, um, in, in compared to, to uh, barrier properties, in HFFR cable formulation, it's not 100% necessary that you have a 100% dispersion of the clay. Um, uh, a medium good dispersion will already um, give the anti-drip and shaft formation performance like we I showed in, in various pictures during my presentation. So that, that's, that's the good part, um, even knowing that uh, sometimes it helps to make a master batch based on EVA in advance or a compacted concentrates in advance. Uh, that's that's uh, one what, what we know from the industry, but also in this case, I would suggest talking to us and we have already um, suggestions or maybe solutions also for this kind of uh, concentrates of clay um, available. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and one last question here. Um, are the products available in North America and Mexico? No clue as to the origin of that question there. Um, actually, we we produce um, these products in the US, so they are available in the US as well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that, I'd like to move on to our next presenter. Mr. Bjorn Hansen is our end use specialist in the uh, thermoplastic industrial application area specializing in our additives and solutions for recycling and odor reduction. Bjorn is based like Jörg at our headquarters in Wesel, Germany. Over to you, Jörg. Uh, sorry, Bjorn. <laughs> Thanks for the kind introduction, Tom, and let's just jump right ahead. So additives for recycling and odor reduction. Um, I give a quick introduction. Um, let's talk a bit about numbers. Uh, 10 billion, I have a slight guess. That's actually the metric tons of plastic produced from 1950 to 2022, uh, 21. So quite a big amount. Um, 370 million tons are produced each year globally, 60 million in Europe. 40% uh, of that is used in packaging. 
and just 10% of these 10 billion metric tons or less uh, was actually recycled. So that means there's a lot of polymer um, still in the world, um, which is, if you're following the headlines in the last years, um, quite obvious because you find um, plastic in the Swiss mountains, in the Mariana Trench, in, in various um, other um, areas in animals. So even if we all say, okay, plastic is good, um, we for sure have to find another way how to use it. Um, just banning plastic, um, that's also not working because if you just look, for example, at this plastic bags, um, there was a study from 2006 uh, about the global warming potential. That's basically CO2 with extra steps. And you would have to use a cotton bag uh, about uh, 130 times um, to have the same global warming potential than a simple HDPE bag. And if you use the HDPE bag from shopping, let's say a second time as a dirt bag, you have to use a cotton bag now three, more than 300 times. So it's not so easy, and especially if you consider food packaging, um, not so good packaging means you have um, not so long storage time in the supermarket. In the automotive, higher weight means more CO2 or medical applications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have to live uh, with plastics. Um, if you look at this recycling symbol in the mid, um, idealist uh, would be um, if you have a real true cycling, but that's not happening because um, during processing, during application, um, this material um, will degenerate, so it reaches the end of the use, and right now part of it is going to landfill, part of it is used for incineration, um, so you have in kind of energy recycling because as long as we are burning, um, a lot of oil, um, it's let's say semi okay to do this because it's just burning oil with extra steps. Uh, best case is you go for recycling. Sometimes you go directly with recycled material for compounding, doing some um, low quality stuff, or you can actually what is sometimes seen as upcycling um, by functionalizing the um, recycled material. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, some pictures of our lab here in Germany. And um, obviously also Bück uh, belongs to the Altana company. And of course, we are also looking what we can do in circular economy, sustainability, climate change, all that um, is covered on our website. If you are more interested in this and anyway, if you are looking for products, I can really uh, direct you to uh, byk.com or do you use or additive guide most of the data sheets you can get without any registration. So that's quite easy to go. For recycling, we have, let's say, three different classes of uh, products. So we have um, the VUC and odor reduction, which comes in the end of the presentation. We have stabilizer packages and we have the polymeric modifiers. Uh, those who listened yesterday will have already met the polymeric modifiers here and there. Um, if you want to use the additives, how much do you have to use? That depends a bit. So if we talk about compatibilizers, typically you will use quite a lot. That can be five, sometimes just 3%, but up to 15%. Um, if you want to incorporate fibers and fillers, you're more in the range of 10 to 80%, thinking of um, WPC, for example. Stabilizers and repair molecules are typically less than 1%, depending on the source material and, of course, on the desired properties. So, what these restabilization additives typically do is they raise the value and the quality. So, you start with really cheap parts and you can, um, with restabilization, use it again for automotive, for outside um, applications like furniture or water tanks. And this enables um, a, a true another life for, for the polymers. Um, going through some numbers here now, um, I think that's a bit more interesting. So here we talk about the recycle book 4371 for battery cases. Um, even electrical cars are still using uh, 12 volt um, starter batteries because uh, of all the uh, systems which still need to run if the main um, battery is shut down um, during non-driving and um, these have a quite good system of collecting. Uh, I'm not sure for the US, um, but um, for most uh, in Europe, um, you get a small fee when you 
uh, you have to pay a small fee when you buy a battery and uh, you can return your old one. So there's a quite high rate of recycled batteries. Um, the problem is you have uh, inside acidic residues, uh, you have metal impurities. So even after purging the recycled material is still, um, let's say, not so easy to use if you use it directly. And if you now look at the, oh, what is it, uh, magenta, reddish uh, line, uh, it drops quite fast here, aging at 135 degrees Celsius. So at 250 hours, the performance is basically a notched impact strength gun. Um, if you use some standard stabilizers, so um, um, classical ones, packages you see at 0.2%, you can extend the lifetime a bit. If you use 1%, it goes up to 1000 to 1500 hours before it fails. Um, our additive is set up exactly for this use case, so um, it helps um, even in low dosages to surpass a, a lot of um, hours compared to the standard stabilizers. Um, here are some more values where you can check. Um, let's say the, the percentage here is given is the total average performance over uh, for example, elongation, tensile strength, tensile modulus, as well as Sharpie impact strength. And we set the base value of uh, control by 100% before aging. And you, here you can see how quickly um, the standard stabilizer package fails. That does not mean that the standard stabilizer package is bad uh, because everyone in the doc is using it. It's quite good. But if there are specific contaminations, uh, these will won't help you that far than, for example, it would do with new material. So there's no point in using right to book for 371 for new material because that was would be too much. Yeah? So um, here you can see how this performs. And other data, for example, here we have an HDPE PP band. So very typical, you have the HDPE bottles and some contamination by polypropylene from the closures. And as you can see here, compared to virgin HDPE, just with 5% um, PP, um, the days to embrittlement drastically is reduced from 130 to 18. With 0.2% of recyclable book, you can get go back to 116, which is not exactly, but quite close to the starting performance. Um, if you, on the other hand, have PVC inside as a contamination, um, then it actually, even with our product, gets quite challenging. So that's always, you need to look at the source of your raw material. Um, Recycle book 4372, excuse me here for the number crunching, but it's actually how the additives work. Um, this is uh, if you want to use HDPE, recycled HDPE for outdoor furnitures. Um, typically in recyclers, you will find uh, some remaining stabilizer material, but it's typically not enough and especially not for UV stabilization um, to survive a long time outside. So without restabilization, the bright blue line, you can see you pass 80% of the starting performance retained tensile impact strengths here. And with 0.2% of the recycle book for 372, this one is designed actually for outdoor um, applications. Uh, you are even at 5,000 hours, you're still at 90%, and uh, the 80% is not crossed before 8,000 hours. Um, I also use this uh, recycle book 4372 for these bottle scrap and uh, yeah, sometimes testing can be hard because the test is still running after more than 8000 hours, but you can also see here a standard stabilizer package here, antioxidant, which is shortened at B2. Um, you all know this uh, package um, is hailing after 2000 hours, while even at 0.1% the recycle book is still running. This is not because there's some magic behind it, it's just a clever setup to counter any negative impurity effects. And uh, the recycle book for 372, for example, for PPEPDM bumper. Um, from the car industry, the bumpers at one point get back and the painting is stripped and cleaned and purged of the bumper. However, some um, solid residues uh, remain and these um, prevent uh, good stability. So um, these negative impacts, impurities uh, lead to uh, fast aging again. 
Um, so much about restabilization, now a bit more about compatibilization, which is also a typical topic which you have to use or have to know about when you talk about recycling material. Um, we have our SCONA modifiers for various groups that can be used for dispersing tie layer adhesion promoters, uh, but we are talking about mainly the coupling agent and compatibilizer effects here, and it's only also a brief overview. So here's some pictures, so typically applications like WPC. And here what happens is that you have um, often wood scrap, um, wood sores, um, and then you try to find some polymer. There are actually some producers who use new polymer for these stackings, but most probably um, prefer to have some scrap, and this can be post-industrial, but also actually post-consumer waste. And the test here, and typically this is not the best scrap which is used, so often a combination of polyethylene, polypropylene, and in this case 50-50, roughly PEPP, and added with 50% wood fibers. And often one thing we get to hear is, hey, I'm, I'm uh, comparing your product against um, my standard and I don't see much advantage. And then I question, yeah, what are you doing? And uh, often the people are comparing just directly 2% of their standard coupling agent against 2% of our coupling agent and see not much difference. The thing is that our coupling agents are quite high loaded and efficient tools uh, that does not increase the maximum performance a lot, but you reach it much more faster. And this is what you see here. So um, you get it with the industry standard 1 or 2% um, um, of the coupling agent, you get an improvement from 50 to something like 65, but with 1% and depending on the product, you really need um, the same performance as 2% of the standard coupling agent. And this is where you have to look when you're using our products. Um, another thing you can do is um, you can lower the footprint. So um, let's say you have uh, a white good and uh, or in, in an automotive some polypropylene glass fiber compound and you have good access to a recycled PET. Um, the recycled PET will have of course a lower footprint and you can now combine um, the PP glass fiber with some PET um, and the PET will form like microfibers inside these polypropylene glass fiber matrix. Um, so it reinforces it and it lowers the uh, footprint. So here's just some data to see what performance is possible. Typical compatibilization, it was already yesterday given, so I will just briefly cover it, is uh, polyamide and LLDPE, typical packaging um, material. Um, again, you create a kind of tensite molecule between the polar polyamide and the unpolar matrix of the polyethylene. And here you can see that with 3% already, you get a nice improvement in impact strengths. And it's not only physical properties, but you can really see the effect if you look at it, comparing these two pictures. Um, strapping tapes can also be um, enhanced with um, the uh, SCONA modifier. Um, I will not go through each and every data here. One thing what I want to highlight is that just saying a computerizer works does not mean it works in all areas. So for example, here you have A and B and you see that you only can compatibilize it when uh, A is actually the dominant phase. So that's to more to the left. On the right side, even with the same product, you don't see any improvement. That's always to know what you do. And you always should use as much shear force as possible if you combine different polymers, which is shown here on the left side. With the same product, you see a small improvement from notched impact strengths from 5 to 8. And on the right side, you go from 4 to 18. One problem with uh, recycled materials often odor. Uh, here, one word of advice if you're coming now with a really bad smelling post consumer scrap. Um, and expect our additive to make the smell completely gone. It's not working this way. Um, I'm not going through all the cover, uh, all the things, but basically what happens is that you have a lot of things inside your um, formulation, like fillers, additives, processing aids, and decomposition due to the process. And all these 
things will form VOCs. You can measure this typically, for example, by fogging, by odor, by total VOC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just explaining the odor, basically you put some sample into a glass bottle, uh, put it into an oven, for example, two hours at 80 degrees Celsius, and then you just smell on it and compare the different samples or you measure headspace. Um, so it gives you an idea how much um, of VOC is actually coming out of it, but you don't know what is actually coming out of it. Typical applications nowadays is seal uh, lights, carbon, or you can use injection of water. Um, the injection thing has the problem that it needs high investment costs. The absorbers have the problem they remain and may influence your final properties. So the P4200 actually works in two step. You can just add it with your standard um, dosing equipment. What you have to have is an actually vacuum degassing. Um, so you can absorb the thing. There's a short movie symbolizing what is happening. So the, you have basically an active ingredient site and acquire solution. Um, and then it's about, and this is absorbed on a carrier. And when you put this carrier onto the extruder, it will melt, the water will release, and with the active ingredient inside, will collect the odor casting substances and will be extracted on the vacuum degassing port. And uh, showing here some data, some process parameters, how this was made. I'm not going into the details here, but one word of advice. Um, if you have bad odor and uh, high VOCs, it may be worse to look also at the processing parameters. So it's the same formulation here. And if you look at the top one, trial 40, 250 RPM, melt temperature 185, and you have uh, roughly 40 in VOCs and a two in odor. And if you add 1000 RPM, logically the temperature raises 280 degrees Celsius, and this gives you 80 and five in order and five is quite bad. Now we use these two trials to test our additive. Uh, actually, this was done at an SKZ center, plastic center in, in Germany. And you can see here that the VOC is greatly reduced so from uh, 40 to 20 for the 550 RPM and from 80 to 50 at the 1000 RPM. And this gives a small odor reduction. How big the odor reduction is depends a bit. Um, it can be, for example, as seen here on the PPGF 30 trial, going from uh, uh, VOCs 150 to 20, and the order going actually down from 4 to 5 to 2 to 3. Um, this is an exceptional good example. It can happen. In average, I would say it's something between 0.5 and 1 in order reduction. And this is not always working because order is quite complex, so you have to test it in all the cases. Um, closing the presentation here, um, some troubleshooting guideline. I will not go through all points, but just an idea. Um, so you say we just talked about order formation. OK, why is it coming from the reason it's impurities or degradation? So you could use a vacuum degassing or product. And um, there are two slides so you can go for yourself. And in the end, also some uh, product examples for recycling, which I also will not go. So any questions on that? Well, thank you, Bjorn. A uh, uh, very good presentation. Again, a lot of information there, a lot covered in a few hours, and this is definitely the topic of the hour. Um, one question, and I wish I had bet money on this being asked, but do we have an additive for compatibilizing polyethylene and polypropylene? <laughs> yeah, that question got asked, uh, gets asked a lot. Um, the, pro the short answer is no. The long answer, yeah, we have some technical possibilities, but typically the price um, does not fit um, the solution. So it's more a theoretical solution, a cheap practical solution um, for PEPP. Actually, in this case, we don't have. OK, thank you. Um, honest, quite honest answer. Um, another question here, um, the Big Max P4200, um, a lot of uh, applications of recycling generate odors, particularly uh, post-consumer waste. Can P4200 be used in other polymers? Yeah, it can be used in other polymers, but not, for example, in polyesters due to hydrolysis. So it contains water um, as part of the effect. It's, it's not the only effect. Um, and uh, when your polymer is sensitive or your formulation, for whatever reason, is sensitive to water, um, you can't use it actually. 
uh, but um, for example polystyrene abs um, there are possibilities but in case you're interested then just talk to us yes indeed um, if any of our uh, audience have further questions um, please feel free to contact um, any of the presenters today or find more information on big.com well, thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Jorg, for uh, staying up late. I know it's uh, it's getting on in Europe now. So um, without further ado, we should move on. Thank you, Tom. So indeed, our next presenter is myself. Um, my name is Tom Inch. I'm the uh, end use market, uh, excuse me, end use manager for uh, thermoplastics industrial applications in North America. So today I would like to uh, take a short look at uh, some ideas, um, solutions for high performance modification of polyamide. Uh, the, the, um, we're going to look at two aspects in particular. We're going to look at impact modification and we're going to look at viscosity modification. But first the theory of, um, of our uh, product here. So, Introduction and theory. Why do we want to modify uh, polyamides? Well, they're great materials for the uses they have, but they also have some problems, particularly high water absorption of polyamide um, and low impact resistance um, is, is often a, a problem in many applications. So you've seen part of this slide before. I like the updated version because there are now uh, a wider family of materials that we're able to uh, graft onto an ever increasing number of material backbones. So today we're going to focus on uh, in, <coughs> for impact modification, the, the use of malic anhydride. And I will get this backwards and forwards button correct before we, uh, we finish the day. So just looking at um, the, the theory behind this. Um, so basically, uh, we use the uh, SCONA modifiers and modified with malic anhydride in this case. The malic anhydride will react with the uh, the end amine and indeed the, uh, the amide groups in the uh, middle of the chain and form these um, amphiphilic tensite molecules. So we now have a, uh, a very tight uh, bond between the non-polar group and the polar group of the, uh, the, the polyamide. Um, so there are many uh, methods for impact modifying nylon, depending on the degree of toughness that, that we're looking for. So right at the very top here, um, two of the hardest applications are super tough and toughness at low, low temperatures. And these are the areas that Bix modifiers uh, play in particular. So we have two materials that, that we focused on for the impact modification, a poly olefin elastomer and our SEBS um, modified products. So <clears throat> how do we apply these products? And, and why is the, the processing important? So generally speaking, we need to process the modifier down to a particular particle size, an optimum particle size for this dispersed phase within the polyamide matrix. And this is done by um, typical twin screw, a particular temperature profile helps, a particular screw profile helps. And if anybody is looking for further detailed information on this part of uh, the, the processing, um, we can provide that um, post presentation. So here we see um, the, the dispersed phase of the elastomeric particle in the brittle phase, the polyamide. And our goal is to reduce that particle size down to an optimum size of dispersion. So depending on the, the dispersion, the, the amount we have, the size of the particles we have, we can alter impact resistance, we can alter flow stiffness, and many of the, uh, the, the, the properties of uh, the, the, the nylon base material. So the mixing conditions um, will then dictate um, the final viscosity of the material, the melt flow, um, and, and that is achieved by uh, 
altering the loading level, the temperature processing and the compatibilizer that we're using. But the ideal is where we achieve um, a particle size in the range shown here by the pink on the graph. This is somewhere around the 300 to 500 nanometers in size. And this is critical because you see here on the left, we have the impact strength that can be achieved um, versus the uh, average particle size. So if we don't disperse the, the modifier properly and we get relatively large particles, we don't get the optimum effect of the impact modification that is possible with the SCONA modifier. With the right processing, we can achieve the ideal range of 300 to 500 nanometers and we see the, the much smaller particle size dispersed in nylon and the very effective impact strengths that we can achieve here. So, <clears throat> What is exceptional about Bic's approach to impact modification using thermoplastic elastomers? Well, we have a product uh, called SCONA TSPOE 1002 GBLL, and we have been able to achieve a particularly high grafting level with that um, material. So typically um, competitive mod modifiers have a grafting level way less than 1%. Typically we see around a half a percent. Um, our SCONA product has three times that grafting level, which then enables us to use what we call a concentrate approach. And that really means that we can dilute the SCONA product with the original or an original base TPO type material to achieve very high uh, and very effective cost and impact modification. So here we see um, typically the, um, the, the addition of uh, the SCONA plus uh, a virgin PoE uh, plus and, and somewhere around the 20% mark. Again, depending on the level of impact modification needed, um, that addition rate is generally seen somewhere between 10, 15, 20% to achieve maximums. That combined with 80% of polyamide gives us these uh, super tough polyamide compounds. And because the SCONA can be mixed with um, an unmodified PoE, this concentrate approach enables us to achieve these high levels of impact modifications at very competitive prices. Typically, we see that ratio of SCONA to unmodified PoE as somewhere around one to two. So here we see some data of this concentrate approach and the uh, the final performance achieved with the, the SCONA modifi modifier. So as we increase the amount of modification, we increase the, uh, the impact strength, um, we reduce the viscosity and we'll get on to viscosity modification later. Um, we also alter the flexible, sorry, the flexural strength and modulus because we're introducing a, uh, an elastomeric material but we can modify the final results by tuning the amount of SCONA TP, TSPOE added to the formulation plus the unmodified PoE. So here again, our example is using the one to two ratio and we call this product CMB1-2. That product is actually available as a product from BIG. Um, so here you see basically what we have done is widen the toolbox available to uh, formulation developers. So we can achieve uh, the, the very high impact modifications using a relatively low total content of modifier, as you can see compared to uh, our competition, um, while at the same time, modification of, of the, the formulation using the, uh, the CMB12, the, the concentrate approach, um, we can do that at lower cost. We can achieve results um, in between, uh, depending on the ratio that's used. So it, it gives uh, formulators a, uh, a, a very uh, wide toolbox. So looking again, we've taken the, uh, the, the, the competitive material out of the equation here. And we're simply looking at the uh, the impact strength versus melt viscosity at different dose levels of the impact modifier. So you can see there that wherever the target might be in terms of melt viscosity and ultimate impact strength, that 
the those of the modifier can put us in the ballpark, um, depending on whether we're looking for much higher impact strength, um, sacrifice and melt viscosity, um, or indeed we want to play with the ratio of SCONA to uh, the unmodified POE and, and give us the, 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 the flexibility to tune the performance of, of these two parameters in to exactly what we're looking for. The, uh, the, the SCONA TSPOE uh, 1002 GBLL is also useful in, uh, in recycled nylon, uh, nylon 6.6. So here we see uh, data comparing the impact strength of uh, different loadings of the, uh, the, the SCONA um, versus um, competitive materials. And again, um, depending on the ratios of the SCONA material to the uh, unmodified elastomer, uh, we can tune the results. So in summary, um, the SCONA material, the TSPOE 1002 GBLL, gives us the ability to achieve a super tough, high, very high toughness modification of polyamide. Um, it also gives excellent low temperature toughness, and um, we'll come back to low temperature in a second. Um, designed to be a concentrate because we've been able to achieve very high um, levels of the, uh, the grafted malic and hydride material. And this uh, concentrate approach, as I said, allows us to dilute with virgin PoE and really tune in the balance between impact strength, flexural strength, viscosity. So looking at low temperature then, um, it's, it's often the case where uh, nylon suffers at, at extremely low temperatures. And very often we see uh, customers asking for minus 40 and even as low as minus 60 degrees C. So while the TSPOE 1002 gives us very good performance down to uh, minus 40, um, and indeed still some performance at minus 60, um, we have another product called TSIN 4013GC, which provides even better performance at the lower temperature because it's based on uh, a, a resin with uh, a much lower TG, which enables us then to really provide some impact performance at extremely low temperatures. The other benefit of the um, the, the TSIN 4013 is it does give us an improved thermal stability, um, particularly useful in the higher melting point or process temperature nylon, such as nylon 6.6 and 4.6. So in this graph, we see the uh, degradation of the TSPOE versus the TSIN, and we can see the onset uh, of the TSPOE is happening around 277 degrees C very adequate for processing nylon 6.6 and copolymers, sorry, nylon 6 and copolymers, um, but a little on the edge as far as nylon 6.6 is concerned. So another option for, for those higher temperature nylons would be the use of TSIN 4013. Another benefit we see of using um, these uh, modifier materials is the improved flow of the, the final compound. So again, looking at uh, this is a development material, our LPs, our lab products. So 24211 is a product that uh, we are introducing that will enable um, impact modification um, with improved flow. So Selection of the uh, the optimal modifier is is really uh, it, it, it it's flexible. We have uh, a, a range of products here that can enable formulators to achieve uh, high flow and high toughness, high flow and medium toughness, impact strength at low temperatures uh, for those uh, higher processing nylons. We have a product uh, for increased with increased thermal stability, um, and indeed um, we can increase the viscosity of nylon where that is a desired property. So that nicely segregates, segues into the last section of the presentation here, which is viscosity modification. So 
Polyamides, uh, depending on the process, depending um, on what you're trying to do, can lack the adequate melt strength. And that's particularly seen in things like extrusion, blow molding, uh, foaming applications where the, the, the melt strength just isn't there for, uh, you know, for example, parison forming, uh, foaming, we can see uh, cell collapse because the, the, the resin just doesn't have uh, required melt strength. So we can modify the, uh, the viscosity again using uh, scoring modifiers. So this time um, uh, we, we use a range of products based on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, based on different resins with different uh, modifiers included. So these resins range from our 2400 GAHD, which is a high density polyethylene product, um, through TPEV, uh, which is a uh, an EVA modified product. Um, in this case, um, they these two products are modified with acrylic acid, um, and we've already talked about the uh, TSPOE, which, if used on its own at high concentrations, can provide very high um, viscosity modification of of nylon. So again, um, depending on the the, the final need for a compound, uh, what specific properties a formulator is trying to look for, um, we can in, in influence, excuse me, influence the viscosity of uh, of of the nylon while um, still achieving um, improvements in in properties such as impact strength. So taking a look here at uh, some some spider graphs, um, looking at the uh, the big TPPE 2400 GAHD, that's a, a high density polyethylene modified product, um, versus a, a typically competitive product here. Uh, we can see the, the increase in melt flow uh, without a substantial effect on other properties such as tensile and modulus um, elongation. And that's at 2%. And when we move to a 5% of modifier, um, you, you can see the, the big decrease there in the typical elongation of uh, of the, the nylon compound when using a competitive product. Um, again, through concentration effects, through the, the, the actual um, modifier used, the, the grade of HD. So effective viscosity modification can be achieved with GAHD at concentrations as low, or addition rates, sorry, as low as 2%. So again, the whole idea of these uh, products and solution is to, to widen the toolbox of formulators, depending on whether they're looking for uh, high impact strength or high or low viscosity modifications. BIC have uh, the toolbox of SCONA and modified products to be able to uh, meet those needs. So looking at very quickly, um, again, the, the three that were mentioned before, Typical dose rates are, are low for the acrylic modified GAHD and 110PS, a um, little higher for the, uh, the TPO based product. Um, they're produced in, uh, in pellets or flakes. Um, and, and again, it's, it's courses for courses, as we used to say in the UK depending on what the uh, the final need, the final application is, BIC have products um, to put in your toolbox to enable those final properties to be met with a balance. So in summary, um, this eye chart is available on BIC.com. Um, it will give you an overall view of the the products and the typical applications and recommendations that um, I've mentioned briefly in this uh, presentation. And with that, I would like to invite any questions. Tom, thank you. Um, great presentation. Don't know who developed it, but they did a nice job. Um, yeah, waiting to see if we get any more questions from the audience. I've got a couple here for you, so why don't we start with these. Um, talk a little bit about the processing temperature, the polyamid, and how that affects the POE. I think you touched upon it in one slide, but just to reinforce, is there a concern there? 
We're really concerned if everything is um, is properly stabilized, um, and really depending on the the process and the temperature and the resin used, um, the PoE 1002 GBL will meet most nylon applications. But if the uh, the temperature starts to get excessive, if there's a particularly high shear in the process, sometimes the case with additional additives. Um, um, fillers, glass fiber um, that needs to be put in there. If the temperature starts to be pushed up, um, then we would recommend a switch to the TSIN uh, 4013. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one, we talked about the um, blending approach with the 1002. Is there any issue with using it undiluted? The, the issue that, that is going to come up undiluted is the, the, the viscosity build. Um, so the, the, the whole toolbox idea, the blending with unmodified PoE is there to provide um, an alternative balance of um, impact modification and viscosity. So yes, it, it can be used. Um, the only caveat would be that um, you know, if there's a limitation on how much uh, viscosity the process can withstand, um, how much torque on the extruder, et cetera, then uh, the formulator and processor would have to be careful about that upper percentage use rate of uh, 1002 on its own. So we'll get very good um, impact modification. You just have to be careful of the viscosity. Is, uh, Correct. Yeah, OK, OK. Um, Looks like one final one. Um, what about stabilization of nylon and how does that affect the PoE? Say, you know, traditionally many people use inorganic stabilizers for nylon polyamides. Uh, can you comment any on how that might affect the, the grafted PoE elastomers? Well, inorganic certainly um, very good for, uh, for the base nylon. Um, not quite so good for the base T, uh, the base PoE. However, um, it's been our understanding experience and from theory that the inorganic stabilizer tends to stay in the pol in, in the nylon phase and not have such a detrimental effect on the the PoE as if one would add inorganic stabilizer, which which you wouldn't to, to base PoE. So in general, it should be OK, um, but I think it would be worthwhile talking to our technical experts with the exact uh, requirements um, and get some um, product and formulation recommendations. Understood. OK, thank you. And I guess it's my turn, so we'll just switch. Um, Tom's going to moderate the questions for the next couple of presentations I'll be presenting and let me turn my camera on and share my screen for everybody. Um, OK, I think I've got it. Uh, Tom, again, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, next up is uh, myself, Lewis Martin. I'm the global head of uh, thermoplastic transportation. Um, I'm going to talk first a bit about heat stabilization of polyamides, and then I'm going to talk uh, uh, about uh, other concentrates. So let me get started. I apologize. There we go. OK, so first uh, for heat stabilization of polyamides, I'm going to talk a little bit about po what polyamides are used for, um, degradation and uh, its causes, how to limit it, options, inorganic versus organic stabilization, um, and a bit about what we offer, a little bit about recycling, and I'll finish up talking about uh, one pack solutions. First of all, I think everybody's familiar with, uh, with the plastic pyramid, as it were. Um, the, there's a, uh, polyamides are a versatile class of engineering plastics that fall kind of right in the middle. They're in the heart and used for a number of different things. They've been around for a long time. There's a lot of them used uh, in excess of, um, 10 million tons per year now. I think this is a little bit old. Um, 
the melting point ranges from 230 to 340, as Tom has mentioned uh, in the previous presentation. And they're relatively easy to process. So used for a number of different things, of course, really good wear resistance, chemical resistance, and also good temperature resistance, which leads to, in fact, a bulk of their uh, applications in my area, which is uh, automotive underhood and, and underbody. So in addition to technical compounds used in automotive, which um, are largely glass filled, but not solely, um, they're also used for textiles, carpets, and even technical fibers like tire cords uh, based on polyamid six, which by the way, need, need stabilization. Um, they're also used in bioaxialia oriented films for an oxygen layer, uh, layer in food packaging and other types of packaging. So let's talk about degradation. It's everywhere. Um, I believe technically inert polymers cannot degrade, but there is no such thing because every polymer comes with impurities, um, catalyst residues, defects. Um, so with those and you add any type of energy and then potentially any type of metals or metal ions, you're going to get oxidation. Um, there's several oxidation products um, peroxides, peracids, alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, acids, other things. So, and it's an autocatalytic process. So you need to act early because these are going to auto oxidize. It's going to happen. Um, need to stop it in the early state. When does it take place? We said always, uh, it happens during the polymerization process. It happens during compounding, extrusion and storage. Then when you'd use it, it happens during injection, molding, spinning, calendaring, thermoforming, recycling, anything. And then again, it's happening during the lifetime of the product, uh, whether it's durable or non-durable, and it does happen in all conditions. Of course, any sorts of energy like light or heat can accelerate it, but it can happen at any time. So effective stabilization is necessary um, to be able to process a polymer additive. We need to protect it during the processing and to fulfill the end use requirements to protect mechanical properties during the lifetime, the color of the product after process and during lifetime, and actually I should say during and after process during lifetime, and uh, anesthetics. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth here. This kind of shows the degradation process, the radical generation, and where different types of stabilizations can come into play. Uh, what I'd actually like to do is talk a little bit more about the mechanism of stabilization. So here you take the polyamide, you add some type of energy generating a free radical. Uh, in a copper-based system or an inorganic-based system, you're going to use the copper to neutralize that uh, free radical. The copper one is gonna move to copper two. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna recover the protective nature of the copper by uh, using a co-stabilizer. In this case, we're showing potassium iodide, which will bring the copper back to copper one, thus restarting the cycle. Of course, what happens there is the potassium iodide is consumed. So really what's limiting the durability of your stabilization here is the potassium iodide, not necessarily the copper. Um, as well, potassium bromides can be used as co-stabilizers. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, what may be the positives and negatives there. Um, higher co-stabilizers uh, contents improve the long-term thermal stability because of this nature here that it's really the co-stabilizer that's uh, resetting the copper stabilization uh, in the formula. So that gives you longer um, thermal stability. Another note is typically you're going to want to use about 100 ppm of copper in a final compound. That's generally for automotive applications, but any application, it's going to require more or less. And of course, we can talk to you about that um, for more details. Now, Organic stabilization is going to act directly using uh, a phenolic. Uh, the phenolic is going to be, in essence, used up when it neutralizes the free radical. So um, 
really what's limiting your long term thermal stability here is the amount of phenolic that you add in there, the amount and to some degree type. This can provide good efficiency up to generally 120 Celsius. Of course, more work's being done. We're doing it uh, to provide higher and longer durability, higher heat uh, durability and longer durability. So kind of a summary of advantages and disadvantages looking at the types here uh, in the middle column, we've got inorganic systems based on copper. Uh, we've noted iodide, but mentioned that uh, bromide could also be used. And on the right, the organic systems. Um, the inorganic systems really provide top-notch uh, long-term thermal stability, and especially at the higher temperatures. Um, and they also act as an excellent light stabilizer. So you kind of get to a uh, two for one here. Uh, challenges with them, disadvantages, you can tend to get poor initial color because uh, you're going to get some coloration in there. You're also, uh, that can change a little bit over time. So these work very well if you're dealing with, for example, black or dark substrates, but maybe a little bit challenging on brighter ones. Uh, they can have some pigment interactions. As has been uh, noted recently, they can have a negative impact on some of the electrical properties, um, both because you're putting copper in there and you're putting the salts in there. And they can, to some degree, be water extractable, thus uh, decreasing the performance. Organic systems, however, do provide excellent long-term thermal stability, uh, typically at lower temperatures. They uh, suffer much less discoloration, uh, don't really interact with the pigments, and they can as well be effective stabilizers for impact modification, as Tom has mentioned. Now, uh, the, the inorganics will tend to stay in the um, polyamide phase, uh, but they could affect the impact modification. So in that case, you might want to lean toward either a mixed system or a phenolic system. But again, if we know your situation, we can recommend something there. Um, these come with a higher cost. Uh, typically, they need to be dosed at a, at a higher level to be effective. Um, so that's going to create a higher cost. And they really don't affect the light stability the same way that the inorganic systems do. So if you're going to use an organic system and you need it to be light stable, you're probably going to also want light stabilization in there. So let's talk about potassium iodide compared with potassium bromide. Um, potassium iodide is the Ferrari. It's really provides the premium heat stabilizer solution for nylons and, and actually the mixture of the copper and potassium iodide provides the best. Um, it has the highest thermal stability, the best processability. It has a maximum melt solubility and superior dispersion. And I think those two right there are the key differences between the iodide and the bromium. And it provides outstanding surface quality. You can use it in all types of polyamide application, uh, certainly including fibers and, um, and films, and in less polar uh, polyamides. It, uh, it also provides the best synergy with other plastic additives, including light absorbers, HALs, and such. Um, what, the, what the bromide does is it's excellent in filled applications. You can match the thermal stability of iodide systems with, with bromide. Um, we've actually at BIC have created uh, bromide systems that are highly melt soluble. So uh, approaching that of, of the iodide systems. And the other thing that the bromide does is provides uh, a potentially more cost efficient solution um, for this situation. And here you can take a look at one quick graph um, showing difference in, in, in melt solubility, but more about that in a minute. So, what products uh, for stabilizing polyamides does BIC offer? Well, we have a range of products. They all fall in our BICMAX HS series. Um, there's about 10 of them. I'm not going to go through them in detail here, but I'll cover um, some different points about them. Um, these all offer superior high temperature thermal stability. Um, we look at tensile retention. In this case, uh, you know, you can expect up to 2000 hours retention at 150 Celsius. In polyamide six, this is 
and even up to 500 hours at 180 Celsius. So higher temperatures. And again, this is dosed at about 100 part per million copper. Here you can see uh, what happens to the percent tensile retention uh, if you just uh, expose um, neat polyamid six unstabilized uh, in an oven at 150 Celsius, you see the decrease. If you if you take a look at small amounts, about a quarter of a percent here, you can see how the different systems that Vic provides uh, perform. Really not dropping below the baseline until you get out close to 2,000 hours of exposure. Another important point if we talk about KBR systems, if cost is important and you want to use a KBR system, um, you can get very, very good uh, thermal stability. Uh, and this graph really shows the difference. Traditionally, KBR based systems had a problem with uh, dispersion, with particle size, and they, the, the bromide is just not as miscible in the polyamide as the iodide is. So if we look at the red line here, and, and what this is, by the way, this is back pressure as measured on an extruder over time. And we're building up back pressure in front of a screen because of course you're getting a buildup on the screen, which is larger particles of the um, KBR that are not dispersing and not passing through the screen. And you can see the red line, what happens over time with a traditional or conventional KBR system is that the the back pressure increases increases with time um, by more effectively processing the kbr uh, bic has created uh, a much more miscible system and you can see here we reach a a, a stable uh, back pressure very quickly and maintain that uh, with with our in this case our 4305 So there are certainly copper-free organic stabilizer systems uh, available. We, we have them to offer. A, um, the specific one would depend on your use case. These offer very low conductivity because again, they don't have the copper or salts in there and good long-term stability. Um, at low temperatures, you can reach 6,000 hours at, uh, uh, in polyamide six. Um, as the temperature goes up, that of course is going to decrease, but you can still, achieve good performance. Um, they're ideal for thermal stability of, of electrical and electronic applications. And of course, these are growing in automotive. So all of the connectors and uh, housings and things like that, this would be a, a good uh, application. Uh, they are, as this mentions, copper and halogen free. And you can see here that if you look at a control, again, this is a neat polyamide six, unstabilized. You see the decrease over time of tensile properties. And then you can see the retention using, in this case, just 0.6% of a copper-free solution. So let's talk a little bit about recycling a polyamide. Of course, this is very important, especially in the carpet industry. Uh, diagram here showing basically a cross-section of, of carpet. And what typically happens is you've got a polyamide tuft on a backing that can be polyolefin, and there can be a lot of other things in there, adhesives, padding, and everything else. Uh, typically, the tuft is shaved off of that backing because what we want to do is recapture the tuft and try to, uh, try to reuse it. So that's going to go, we need that to go from carpet to pellet, to, in this case, parts being represented by, by tensile bars. Uh, the challenge is that recycled polyamide contains 5 to 15% impurities. This can be olefins, fillers, other organic matter that you can imagine comes with recycled carpet. Um, these impurities absolutely negatively affect the tensile strength, so that requires compatibilization. Um, and because these are going into potentially high performance and uses, they require restabilization or a boost in stabilization. So I think we've touched on compatibilization in a number of different areas here. We certainly can help with that. Um, and as well, many of the stabilizers that we've discussed will act in this regard.
So one last area I'd like to talk about in this presentation, um, that is the challenges in handling plastic additives. Uh, many of these additives are low melt. They want to stick to things. Um, they want to melt readily. That can make them difficult to feed as a powder into the main feed th throat, for example, because, because they bridge or they're going to want to stick to uh, feeder screws. Um, the combination of additives uh, can many times be have dissimilar particle sizes, which means they would want to segregate or stratify. Um, they can be dusty and fluffy, so they don't feed well. They can also lead to safety HSE hazards, uh, health, safety, environmental. Um, and if you have micro ingredients, which means very minor amounts, then quality control is a problem because ensuring that you get consistent feeding of those small amounts is key to performance. Um, the only alternative there, of course, is to overdose them to make sure you get good dispersion. But uh, again, that's not cost effective. So all of this is if you're not careful, can lead to dispersion issues, to inconsistent feeding, um, not getting adequate um, stabilization uh, throughout the polymer melt. Um, so what BIC does, BIC has a number of different solutions to handle these things. We can supply any form. Uh, as it mentions here, we can supply many times 100% active free flowing pellets by compacting. We can supply pre-blended powders. We can even supply uh, compounded pellets in, uh, in uh, uh, carriers compatible with your situation. Um, we have hybridized systems between organic and inorganic. For example, let's go back to the case of a, of a impact modified um, system where you need organic to stabilize the polyamide phase and uh, or I'm sorry organic to stabilize the olefin phase and inorganic for the uh, polyamide phase. We certainly have done that. Um, these systems or these products because of these the forms we can provide can maximize your productivity and help you accurately dose the products. A lot of this leads to simplified inventory and production. Uh, and we can work with you on any customer specified uh, blends you might have. So with that, uh, I'll just finish up with this. Uh, there are inorganic copper based stabilized systems using either potassium iodide or potassium bromide as co-stabilizers depending on your requirements. There are copper free organic stabilizer systems based on phenolics and others. Um, BIC has ready to use tailor-made one packs. Uh, we can combine these with other active ingredients such as mold release, nucleation, compatibilizers, anything else. Uh, we have many forms, for example, compacts uh, for twin screw extruders, predispersed concentrates for single screw, and we have ultra high heat stabilization systems withstanding up to uh, 230 Celsius or even uh, slightly higher um some of those exist more are under development so and with that i will say thank you and pause tom would you like to jump in with any questions yeah lewis let me say thank you uh it was a very comprehensive overview of big's uh, products and solutions for polyamides did you notice i said polyamides instead of nylons old habits die hard they do. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions and I, yeah, we have a, a couple of minutes. Um, you mentioned the hybrid thing there. I see one question here it says, when did you, when do you select organic heat stabilizer systems versus inorganic? So personally, uh, my choice would be to opt for an inorganic if possible. It, they certainly are the most efficient from a, dosage percentage as well as it was a cost percentage, um, they are very durable. However, if you bump into any of the problems we've mentioned, such as um, uh, true long-term stability or higher temperature, or I'm sorry, if you bump into any of the problems, the opposite of that, that we mentioned that the inorganics have, and that would be color, 
uh, or electrical conductivity, then we'd start looking for the organics uh, for those types of solutions. Okay, and uh, I think you, you're you reading my questions here because <laughs> the last one you just mentioned there, high temperature, long-term thermal stability. Um, one uh, member of the audience is asking here, have we explored LTTS at 200 degrees C or above? And yeah, the, the answer is yes, we've worked on we seem to want to go in 30 degree increments, 120, 150, 180, 210, but then we go to 230. Um, so we have done developments uh, at least up to 230 Celsius. Um, and so certainly we've got data at 210 and 230 on different developments. Uh, what we're trying to understand really is where, what does the market need now with, with, the, with the conversion, certainly in the automotive market from internal combustion to uh electric vehicles it seems like the demands are changing uh love to hear more from customers but it seems like customers are looking more for uh maybe slightly lower temperatures but longer durability um but we certainly can be higher than uh 200 yes okay thanks um well i i would encourage uh, everyone that uh, is asking questions and i'm not able to get to here um to contact um lewis or or indeed any of our group or bake.com if you're looking for more information on these products but to uh, keep the show rolling on schedule um i'd like to introduce our next presenter which is lewis well done <laughs> two in a row so uh yeah you get uh, you get a bonus for this one lewis so uh all yours again thank you all right thank you sir i'll try to bring us over the over the finish line here today um and i think we are right on time so good to know uh, i'm going to talk a bit about other compounds and concentrates we have um to offer um uh, so jumping right into it, uh, just to kind of reiterate, with all the things you've seen, you know that BIC has quite the toolbox that we can we can use to create solutions. Um, we have a number of different proprietary chemistries and many different processes to provide different uh, product forms for you. Um, these then put offerings in different categories compacted products that uh, can be 100% active, uh, concentrates, which then would be predispersed in some uh, polymeric carrier, either the exact same carrier you're using or a very compatible carrier. Uh, we also have additives that are 100% powder, pellet, or of course, I think everybody knows even in liquid form. So we have the ability to provide a form that uh, is most helpful to you. So, oh, I'm supposed to say because of that red box that I'm going to talk about concentrates in this presentation. A um, couple areas. First, I want to mention that uh, a lot of of these um, different functionalities we can provide in multifunction packages, and we do that. Um, as I mentioned in the last presentation, multifunction packages provide a number of benefits. Uh, increased dosage accuracy, improved HSE, improved inventory because you're stocking one item in, uh, instead of multiple. Um, as well, if you're feeding these into, say, a glass filled resin, uh, you only have to worry about uh, one uh, formula input. So it's sometimes on the manufacturing floor a little easier to make sure that you're on formula. Um, we also have some specific manufacturing technologies that enable us to combine multiple different functionalities at very high concentrations without risk of interaction. Even there are certain uh, stabilizations that don't like to play together, I'll say. Uh, we can keep those apart and still provide them in a one pack solution. So we have a lot of different concentrates available. These are all different concentrates. Uh, if you look at these functions, I'm going to focus on the top three, thermal stabilization, ultraviolet stabilization, and flame retardants. The rest of these exist, and of course you can find them on Vic.com. Um, these are also all available in a compounded concentrates selection chart. So 
not to be outdone by Tom. I've made this more of an eye chart than the one in his presentation. Um, but certainly you can ask us for this chart. We can email it to you uh, or it's available out on BIC.com as well. So let's talk about specific multifunction products uh, that are off the shelf available. These all uh, really have to do with olefins. We've got one specific one here, the 4142 that has uh, flame retardant UV and odor reduction for films. And uh, the, some of you may know that it's some of these things don't play nicely together. So combining this into one package um, is nice. The rest of these are really products for glass filled poly, uh, polypropylene uh, in different forms. We have here antioxidants and a standard black for glass reinforced. And I'm gonna come back to why we Ch uh, choose to put the black in there. I'll come back to that later. Uh, one for direct processes and, and, and then one here for higher temperature longer term. Um, this one is antioxidant coupling for glass reinforced and then this one is all three antioxidant coupling and black for glass reinforced. So let's talk about thermal stabilization. Similar to my last presentation on polyamides, uh, it degrade polypropylene also degrades when exposed to oxygen. It's accelerated with the addition of heat uh, or with the addition of shear and extrusion, which adds heat. It causes a reduction in molecular weight. That reduction in molecular weight then affects the strength of the polymer, mat polymer matrix, but it can be easily measured and monitored using melt flow rate. Of course, that's why we use that test. Uh, a properly designed antioxidant will reduce that. Uh, Here's an example. What we did here is created a simple um, antioxidant, two component antioxidant package. We've just called it package one, uh, adding it at two different levels, and you can see the difference in performance here. As we, and we didn't bother in this case to uh, test an unstabilized polypropylene because what would happen is that unstabilized polypropylene would probably double in melt flow with one extrusion pass. But here you can see as you go through multiple extrusion passes, and this is one, this is actually three, so we're skipping one here, and then this is five. As you go through multiple extrusion passes, you can see what happens to the melt flow rate, and then that correlates directly to the molecular weight and the strength of the polymer. Um, so we're losing strength here. You can gain that back or protect it by adding in an antioxidant. Um, the same happens or is uh, exacerbated by increased process temperature. Uh, that requires additional stabilization. And this is really a, uh, an important point, and this is why we really need to know what your process temperature is so that we can help recommend uh, an appropriate dosage level. Now here, I've kind of flipped this chart around um, these are numbers of passes. So if you see here, the dark blue line um, is one pass at different temperatures. So you can see that after one pass, as you increase the temperature, the uh, melt flow rate increases, indicating the molecular weight is decreasing. Then you can see that same function with three passes and with five passes. So you can see that as the temperature goes up, the molecular weight decreases um, and as the number of passes. So this can get very bad. I know that most people are gonna say, hey, I process, process my polypropylene down here, uh, probably 210 to 230. Uh, that would be very typical. I know of people that process between 250 and 270. So I certainly know this situation exists. And the other thing that you need to remember is localized shear heating, that as that polymer is passing either through a gate over a, a, a screw land, that it can see localized shear heating uh, in excess of your melt temperature. So that will have an effect as well. Again, it's important to stabilize. So let's talk about in-use stability. Now we've talked about making, uh, making the compound, making the part, we get it out in the field, and what is the olefin seeing? So if we take a typical test of exposure at 150 Celsius, oven exposure at 150 Celsius, Normally, you're going to want to survive a thousand hours. 
So here you can see this happens to be uh, a use case of 30% glass filled homopolymer polypropylene. We actually used our SCONA 20097 uh, coupling agent and we used our BICMAX HSO1 uh, 4301 stabilization. Um, that was, this shows different dosage levels of that uh, HS4301. Now I'll note that that is 33% active. So that's important because this is the dosage of the actual concentrate. But you can see that at all dosages, one, uh, one to um, 6%, it survives a thousand hours. So you don't need more than one. However, longer term durability is certainly possible simply by increasing the dosage. So let's, uh, let's talk about an interaction, and that is the UV performance as a function of the antioxidant synergist level. This specific case happens to be in high density polyethylene. You could see it in other, other things. Um, and it's, it really proves the point that you have to specify your antioxidant system and your UV system together. Uh, if you don't, you can run it into decreased performance of one or the other. What this is showing is this is number of hours to 0.1% carbonyl absorb absorbance, which is an indication of degradation. So what we're trying to do here is, is, is maintain this high level. And you can see as we, in this case, add in higher amounts of the antioxidant synergist, we get decreasing performance, uh, UV performance, UV resistance. So again, that's why it's key to develop these systems, specify these systems together. That's the antioxidant and the UV. Another issue that can happen is carbon black or other types of particles in there can adsorb or otherwise affect the antioxidant performance. If we take a look here, this is a reference system. As you, as you start to add in carbon black, you can dramatically decrease your uh, hours to embrittlement. This is kilo Langley's, but it's basically time to embrittlement at different temperatures because the, the carbon black is affecting it. Again, this goes back to the reason why we like to add the carbon black in there so that we can make sure that we're picking a carbon black that functions well with the antioxidant system and um, we're supplying that to you and, and, and we know what kind of performance you're going to get. So on our selection chart, there's uh, you'll see these materials listed. Uh, I'm not gonna go over them here again, it's a bit small, but just to note that they're there. So let's talk about UV stabilization uh, for a minute. What happens? Well, I think everybody knows the polymer comes in, it can have things like catalyst residues, UV light hits it, and you generate free radicals, and, and, and we, we start degrading the polymer. This is the oxidation cycle. Again, not so dissimilar to what we talked about in the polyamides. What can you do to stabilize that? A number of different things. Um, you can reduce or prevent light absorption by the chromophores using screeners or absorbers. You can deactivate excited states of chromophoric, chromophoric groups with quenchers, or you can decompose the hydroperoxides and, uh, and things using hindered amines. Um, again, we have to understand the application and the requirements to specify a system. Don't wanna give you more than you need and don't wanna create more cost than is necessary. Um, what do UV screeners do? That's exactly it. They screen it, they block it, they reflect it. Um, Anything that blocks or reflects light is going to act that way. So fillers, carbon black pigments. I'll mention carbon black. I have a lot of experience in the automotive industry. Uh, a lot of people feel that you can make something weatherable with carbon black. It is true that, that the bulk will survive because the carbon black will block it from getting to the bulk. But what the carbon black doesn't do is protect the very surface layer of the polymer. So you can still get some chalking. And while that's only visible, uh, and doesn't maybe affect the uh, strength properties of the part, it still can lead to a, a rather ugly part. UV quenchers are going to act in that cycle to counteract the free radicals. 
Um, quenchers need to have a fast migration rate. We need them at the surface. So sometimes I hear people worried about things migrating to the surface. In this case, you need these migrating to the surface um, where they can act. Um, these also in a, in a multi-component system are going to enable the HALs to function longer because these are going to be your short-term actors. And then you've got the hindered amines, uh, the workhorses, which are really a backstop, going to work in concert with other things. They pro really provide the long-term pro uh, protection. And, and again, here, migration over time is key for the functionality. So the quenchers need to migrate fast, these need to migrate slower, and you need to de design the system so that it functions in that way. What can you expect? So what we did here was, again, a similar 30% glass-filled polypropylene system. In this case, we used our BICMAX LS4125 dosed at 1% on the polypropylene, which would be 0.7% on the total then. And we weathered it according to the SAE J2527. Uh, I'll note that this is exposure in kilojoules. Typically, you're going to want to reach 2,500 to 3,000 at a minimum, and you want to have a maximum delta E change in color of three. So here you can see the delta E is the dark line, and it really never goes above one, even at double the specification limit. The, the cyan line, lighter blue line here, is actually the, the 60 degree gloss reading, and you can see that has some fluctuation, but really does not change over this time span. So certainly able to meet, easily meet automotive specifications. Uh, another interesting one uh, worked on a while ago. This happens to be a 40% glass filled polypropylene, more for structural purposes, looking at making this black and making it last outdoor. Uh, tested it according to J1960. Now this happens to be ours, so not to confuse things. The last one was kilojoules, this is ours. And you can see we took this out to 14,000 hours. Now what you'll see here is out to about 9,000 hours, the Delta E is pretty consistent, or I'm sorry, that is the gloss, is pretty consistent. And then you start to see some dulling after 9,000 hours, but we still don't get the Delta E change. It's, it's still around two, never exceeds three. The point is that long-term durability is truly feasible. This was actually more of a construction application, not automotive. So you're, you're gonna want longer durability there. And it's certainly possible with the right system. In this case, we dosed the 4125 at 2% to get, get that. So just an overview of some systems that are included in our selection chart uh, that we mentioned before. Okay, let's talk about flame retardants. Uh, earlier, Jorg talked about those a bit and some of our synergists. Um, I'll cover it a little bit more. So I think everybody knows, and I'll just click through these and get them all on the screen, um, that you've got halogenated, non-halogenated. Um, every, everybody wants to get rid of the halogenated ones. They tend to be, uh, they act chemically in the gas phase. They tend to have a lower impact on physical properties because they're effective at lower dosages, about one third. Um, uh, but they can have a higher impact on antioxidant and UV systems. Non-halogenated work a bit differently. Um, physical and chemical, of course, creating that char uh, to separate the flame uh, from, the, from the oxygen. So we've got a number of different systems here. Uh, I think Jorg mentioned the 4143 that's listed and others are listed um, in our other literature. So with that, I will stop and say thank you for your attention. Um, Tom, I hope you're still with me. Yes, indeed, Lewis. Thank you very much. Wow, that really was a lot to get through because that that truly is the biggest range of, of products. And, and I guess that's the one that, that expands fastest as we develop uh, new formulations and cus customers ask us for, uh, for new blends of uh, different concentrates and different effects. So since you did two presentations back to back, I'm gonna give you two questions combined into one here, just Lovely. to challenge you. How important is color to UV importance and why do you add carbon black to many heat stabilization mass batches? 
OK, I have to remember. So of course, color, every one of the pigments weather differently. They they each one of them has differs in light stability. We need to know that so that we can stabilize the system accordingly. Uh, also, we want to make sure that the pigment and anything we're putting in um, play nicely together. So I would say that we want, you know, interactions need to be minimized and as well, we just need to know how stable the pigment itself is. Um, uh, and for the carbon black, I did kind of mention that carbon black, uh, uh, carbon black can actually adsorb different stabilization systems. So if you're not careful, in a UV scenario, it can be more or less stable. So the particular carbon black you use is going to dictate how much and what type of UV system you need. But as well, it can decrease the performance. So we want to be very careful that you're not putting in a carbon black and then and then that's negatively affecting the performance. The, the carbon blacks we cho choose, we've already tested them for thermal stability. We've tested them for UV stability. So when you look at the results we're providing, then you can feel confident that uh, that you'll get those results. Very good. So yeah, a little bit of a trick question because um, carbon black uh, does have um, a bigger effect on UV stability than uh, than many pigments. Okay, and um, we've we've talked a lot about coupling uh, compatibilization or scoring a range of pigments today. But one uh, question here is, um, what is the appropriate level of coupling agent for different levels of glass fiber? Oh, great question. So. Um, Really gut answer to that is about 1% for 30% glass fiber. Uh, I think that a number of our coupling agents work, I know they work well at lower at 0.6 or 0.7%. Um, as your fiber content goes up, your dose of uh, coupling needs to go up so that you appropriately uh, coat the surface. Um, so that's a little tricky because if you go to 50 or 60 percent, you're going to want more. But generally, about one percent uh, uh, coupling agent for 30 percent glass. Um, yeah, that's a good rule. I might add there, Tom, that you don't want to overdose your coupling because as you go beyond one percent, you could see a minor increase. But as you then get around 2% and above, you're actually going to start to see your prop properties decrease slightly. Um, that's due to really, you're just the coupling agent, the extra coupling agent you're acting in, adding in doesn't act to couple. It just acts as a low molecular weight, uh, almost a contaminant in the polymer matrix. So you're starting to decrease the properties of your polymer matrix by adding in too much. So just like with most things, the right amount is is key. Yeah, I guess that's uh, one aspect of uh, our Scona products um, that there really wasn't covered in the last few days presentations. Um, we focused on other attributes that these products bring to the polymer systems. So with that, um, I guess I've noticed as probably many people have over the past couple of years with the tremendous increase in the number of uh, Teams meetings that we do that everybody likes when we finish early. So I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm going to thank our audience very sincerely for uh, tuning in to our webinar. Um, some of you today, some of you for uh, the last two days, but we uh, sincerely appreciate your interest in big products and solutions. And I look forward to doing this again uh, at a future date. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, our audience, and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody.